What is the best build for vintage gaming? Is there even such a thing? Well, some people would say DOSBox, and personally, I'm one of them. However, I just want to feel the real 90s, I want to play games on real vintage hardware. And that's what this video is all about. Let's go for a bit of a downgrade then. Over the years, I've built countless computers to make sure that I can use any vintage hardware I may happen to come across. I reckon I found the proper build for myself. Let's try and find the proper build for everybody else. And let's start with the CPU. Most of the time I use this. It's a Socket 478 motherboard for Pentium 4. It's the last system that can use ISA slots with direct memory access, which is essential for ISA sound cards on some other ISA peripherals. It's the fastest system you can get. Fastest, however, doesn't necessarily mean best. It can take up to 4 gigs of RAM, which is nice, but it can introduce certain problems in certain operating systems. It works perfectly fine in Windows NT or XP. Windows 95 or DOS is a bit different story there is. For two reasons. DOS 6.22 can address up to 64 MB of extended memory via DPMI using IMMSYS version 3. This board is using DDR memory modules and smallest memory you can get for this board is 64 MB. Which would be fine, but they are so scarce it's quite difficult to find one. And even though you somehow manage to get one, there are programs that have problems with that much memory and simply won't work. For example, Gravis Ultrasound's emulators just refused to work until I switched to a different board with 32 MB of RAM. If you reckon the more power equals better, it's not this case unfortunately. Most of the programs and games work just fine, loading times are better, performance is also better, but there are games and programs that can have certain problems with that much power. Some games will write out crash, others won't run at all, there can be problems with sound or music, controls, lockups, etc. There are also badly written games that can't keep constant speed with faster CPUs and run so fast it renders them unplayable. It is possible to slow down the computer using a couple of workarounds. If the BIOS board supports it, you can turn off L1 and L2 cache or underclock the CPU. Or a utility called SetMore can be used to lower CPU speed or turn the caches off without the need to go to the BIOS and rebooting the computer. Other than that, this system is overall outstanding universal retro gaming machine with lots of power. This particular board is an industrial board from IEA that has some nice features. Like this compact flash slot for example, which you can use instead of ordinary hard drive. If you want to use ordinary drive anyway, you've got two choices here. Older and slower parallel ATA or new and faster serial ATA. What is not so great about this system however, is the availability of boards with ISA slots. You can find socket 478 boards all over the eBay quite cheap, but it's almost impossible to find the boards with ISA slots for a reasonable price. Then there's this, Pentium 2 on Pentium 3. When Intel released Pentium 2, it didn't use sockets anymore, but rather a better system, they named it slot 1. It was a cracking setup, you just took the CPU and slammed it into the slot. You didn't have to worry about bent pins when putting it in or taking it out. First generation of Pentium 3, codenamed Ketmai, was the same format as Pentium 2, but then Intel realized that the production will cost less if they go back to the system they previously used. On second generation of Pentium 3, codenamed Coppermine, was once again made this way. Pentium 2 and Pentium 3 suffer from the same problem as Pentium 4, they are too fast for some DOS games and programs. Pentium 4 used a different technology that allowed to increase frequency of the CPU about 3 times that of Pentium 3. Fastest Pentium 3 could go up to 1.4 GHz and fastest Pentium 4 was 3.4 GHz. And even though the Pentium 4 was a newer technology and at higher clock rate, the Pentium 3 wasn't lagging too much behind. In fact, in some operations it was even faster. First generation Pentium was quite a big step for Intel. Apart from other improvements, Pentium was Intel's first superscale processor, which means it can execute more than one instruction per clock cycle. It was a great performance boost compared to 486. Slowest Pentium was running at 60 MHz, fastest Intel 486 was running at 100 MHz, or I'd say these two CPUs were roughly on par performance wise. Release of Pentium CPU wasn't all rainbows and unicorns, however. Early Pentium CPUs had a couple of design flaws. A bug called FDIV, for example, could affect some calculations. When dividing a number, it could return incorrect floating point results. Even though that happened very rarely, 
Intel reacted quite promptly and recalled all affected CPUs right after the bug was discovered. Pentium was an Intel's iron product, however, though. It was Pentium Pro. It was always this well dream of mine. It was made for servers, was filthy expensive, had tons of cash and looked so much cooler than ordinary Pentium. I managed to get a couple of these much later, when they were practically free. Now, I've got this dual Pentium Pro setup, which I fancy very much. I fancy to use it for sentimental reasons, nothing else. Those can't take advantage of dual CPU setup anyway. It's a shame Intel didn't implement their MMX technology that came a year later into Pentium Pro. MMX allegedly doesn't mean anything. Unofficially, it's an acronym for Multimedia Extension. It's an instruction set implemented in Pentium processors that should speed up some floating point calculations when used by a program. It was primarily developed to help graphic cards in their calculations. In reality, the performance boost when a program used MMX instructions was about 20% tops, which is not exactly mind-blowing. I still remember one of the adverts for Pentium MMX, which I couldn't find anywhere online, unfortunately, that advertised that with MMX instructions there will be more spaceships in our games and more stuff in our videos, etc. Everybody involved in IT understood what it meant, but it was so poorly worded it actually didn't make any sense. There were technically two versions of 486, SX and DX. The main difference was that DX had a mathematical coprocessor while SX did not. It made a huge difference when dealing with programs heavy on calculations, like games for example. If I remember correctly, my friend had 486 SX 250 MHz. Right after I bought Crusader No Remorse, I brought the game to him, we installed it on his computer and ran it. What I saw could be described as, well, rubbish. If you're wondering what could be rubbish about it. I was horrified because I also had 486, also 50 MHz, the same VJ card, but mine was DX2. I was expecting similar results, but to my surprise, it ran perfectly fine. Not only frequency matters, but FPU is quite important as well. Foster Sinto 486 was DX4 100 MHz, but AMD released a clone running on 133 MHz, and it was fast enough it could compete with Pentium running on 75 MHz. This is the AMD CPU. And if you look at what's written on it, yeah, this is probably the first time when AMD started comparing their CPUs with Intel's. In this case, claiming that their 486 is as fast as Pentium 75. When dealing with 486, you need some hard drive controller. Unlike Pentium motherboards, where IDE controllers are already integrated, 486 motherboards rely on external controller you need to put in a slot and connect a drive to. You may have noticed these brown slots. These are VLB slots, which stands for Visa Local Bus. They are unique to 486 motherboards. It was technically an ISA slot upgrade to provide the same features as an ISA slot but with greatly increased bandwidth. VLB was later replaced by PCI, but since the Pentium was around the corner, no many 486 motherboards featured PCI slots. However, though, some ironed boards had both PCI and VLB together. 386 is useful in a situation where you need a slow system to get speed sensitive games working normally. But if you know some kind of masochist or collector or someone who enjoys very old games like Lemmings or Dune, don't even bother with 386 or 286 systems. Sure, if you want it for nostalgia's sake, go for it. But if you want to play all sorts of games, don't. Well, this should be quite fast and easy to answer, just get the fastest card you can. Alright, I'll be more specific. In case of Pentium 2, 3 or 4, get an AGP card, and it means either Nvidia or ATI. They are fastest and work everywhere, DOS on Windows. For systems without an AGP slot, you'll need PCI, VLB or ISA card. Again, try to get the fastest card you can. Also K7 motherboards have PCI slot, but you may get lucky and find Pentium board with an AGP slot. If possible, try to avoid ISA VJ cards, they are just too slow to handle most of the newer games. Even some DOS games can use 3D accelerator cards to accelerate 3D graphics. Lots of video card producers were trying to offer some kind of 3D acceleration in early 96, Rendition, S3, Nvidia or Matrox. None of them, however, were as successful as 3D effects with their voodoo graphics.
There's a bunch of DOS games that need a 3D FX card to use 3D hardware acceleration. And this is where it gets a bit messy. Voodoo Graphics, also called Voodoo One, was the first Voodoo card. Unlike other 3D video cards, it was a 3D acceleration add-on card that needed additional 2D card to work. It had to be connected with this kind of cable. As far as I know, it works fine in every DOS game that supports Glide, an API developed by 3D Effects for their Voodoo card. It's plenty powerful for any DOS game you can imagine, but newer games for Windows like Unreal for instance struggle quite a bit. Don't even bother with Voodoo Rush. Even though it's practically Voodoo 1 with 2D chip on the same board, which eliminates the need for another 2D card, the Voodoo part is somewhat slower due to shared resources. Then came Voodoo 2. It was much faster, it could undo most of the earlier Windows games and pretty much all DOS games, except for maybe three of them that just needed Voodoo 1. What's so special about Voodoo 2 is that it can be used in the Salai mode, which stands for Scan Line Interleave. It means that you can use two Voodoo 2 cards connected together. One card renders even lines, the other card renders odd lines. That results in roughly twice the performance and since like this you've got also twice the memory, you can use higher resolution in games. 3D effects didn't learn from their first mistake and released another 2D 3D combination crap card, this time named Banshee. Even though the 2D acceleration was pretty good, 3D however was again a disaster. For the 3D part, Banshee used only half of the Voodoo 2 hardware, which made it bloody slow. So don't get Banshee either. Voodoo 3 may also be a good choice. It's got some pros and cons, let's start with pros first. Voodoo 3 is again 2D 3D card that doesn't need any additional 2D card to work. Voodoo 3 has got much better 3D graphics quality than Voodoo 1 or 2, but there's a couple of cons too. Even though 1 Voodoo 2 is slower than Voodoo 3, 2 Voodoo 2s in SLI modes are still a bit faster. There is also slight compatibility issue. Voodoo 3 works in most of those games, but some of them work only with Voodoo 1 or Voodoo 2. Voodoo 4 and 5 are quite terrible cards. Ridiculously expensive, terribly slow compared to Nvidia or ATI cards from the same year, and what's most important, they don't work in DOS. If you want one for your collection, go ahead and get it. It's quite rare and interesting, but it simply can't be used for DOS gaming. As I said in the beginning, ISA slot is essential for retro builds, and sound card is the essential part. If you want to run only Windows on your rig, Virtually any sound card will do, ISA or PCI, in terms of functionality. However, if you plan to run DOS games, you need some ISA sound cards, unless of course you find with no sound or music in your games. Every ISA sound card sounds a bit different. For that, go and watch my series of videos about ISA sound cards. There you may find more output card to choose. It basically breaks down to two things, compatibility or MIDI playback. Sound Blaster Pro 16 or ESS 1868 sound cards could be the right choice for someone who wants maximum compatibility on best FM music in games. On the other hand, if you want perfect MIDI playback and willing to sacrifice compatibility, you may look for Roland RAP10 or Gravis Ultrasound, but they may not work in games you fancy. There are, however, two rather expensive possibilities to maximize compatibility and also get perfect MIDI playback. The first one is to get Sound Blaster 16 or ESS sound card with Wave Blaster connector, which is this connector on your sound card. Then get a Wave Blaster daughter board, connect it to the Wave Blaster connector and select general MIDI in the game setup, and that's it. As well as sound card, every daughter board sounds different, so make sure you get the one you fancy most. The second possibility is an external sound module. Start with the same sound card, either Sound Blaster 16 or ESS. Almost all sound cards have game port connector for connecting either joystick or an external MIDI module. Once the module is connected, it works the same as the daughter board. You need to choose general MIDI or MPU for one compatible hardware in the game setup. This setup could be even more expensive, but the external module can also be used with your keyboard or any MIDI musical instrument to improve its synthesis. Safe bet would be Roland SC55, which is sort of quote unquote ultimate sound module. Since it was used by Bobby Prince to compose music for Doom, Duke Nukem, etc., those games will sound exactly as he initially intended. And of course it's great in other games as well. However, my personal favourite is Yamaha MU2000, or any Yamaha with XG support for them. Uh. 
I often see a mouse reproduction much better, but it's just my personal preference. Like this, you'll get maximum compatible sound card with great FM synth and cracking wavetable. But if you feel it's not enough and you've got some more money to spend, get also Roland's MT32. It's an old external module that was used in early games like Monkey Island, for example. Without the MT32, you are stuck with FM synth in these games. It's definitely worth getting. There's not much to say about this topic. If the drive is for DOS 6.22, you won't be able to use more than 2GB per partition and there can be only 4, which means you can use only 8GB total. DOS 7.1 can handle much more, 124GB per partition. If you are deciding what drive to use, there are a couple of deciding factors. SCSI drives always need an additional controller. From Pentium up to the latest board, all boards have some kind of IDE controller integrated. There are even boards with integrated SCSI controllers, but they are quite rare. SCSI controllers have their own CPU, which is great since it doesn't use computer's resources. When IDE starts accessing the drive, the computer becomes virtually unusable in games. You can connect up to 15 devices to an SCSI controller, including drives, CD-ROMs, etc. IDE controllers support only two devices per channel, and there are usually two channels on the board. SCSI drives are a bit faster, they usually run at 10,000 or 15,000 RPM. IDE drives usually run at 5400 or 7200 RPM. Since the CSI drives run at such high speeds, they tend to be a lot noisier. Whatever system you're gonna use, just get the largest and latest drive the motherboard or controller can handle. Later drives tend to be faster and more silent, so even if you can't use the entire drive, you'll get quiet and fast system. This is the easiest answer. Get whatever you find that's working. I've got only one recommendation on this Pioneer DVD 1.0 6S. It's the best drive I've ever had. Not only it could read extremely damaged media other drives could not, but its slow in loading mechanism is sick. Well, I finally got to the point. What's the best possible retro build then? I'll try to be as objective as possible. If I didn't have about a billion different systems at home like I do now, I'd choose Pentium 3, either slot 1 or socket 370, it really doesn't matter much. I would get IS clock where I could find and motherboard with Intel BX chipset, which is the best there is. Yeah, other chipsets are fine too, but be careful, do not mix up BX with BXL chipset, it really is a piece of toss. BX is a way to go, and there are tons of these motherboards out there for a couple of quid. I'd get as much memory as possible for Windows, and one spare 32MB memory module in case less memory is needed for some DOS games or programs. Then fastest AGP video card I could find, for example NVIDIA GeForce 5500 or ATI Radeon 9550, which are quite cheap and it paired with at least one Voodoo 2. These cards are fast enough to endure any Windows game and the Voodoo is there for games that need Glide to work. Sound card would be Alpha Sound Blaster 16 or ESS 1868 with an external sound module, On there would be Roland SC55 to be able to play all games with Roland's wavetable. Sound Blaster's FM synth would be there as a sort of backup in the case there is no general MIDI support. I wouldn't buy an SCSI drive since it really can get quite noisy and that bit of a performance boost over IDE is not worth it. I'd go for a largest IDE drive I could find, they tend to be faster and quieter. And there you go, this is what I'd call the best retro build. It's universal, it's fast, it works in every OS and it's quite cheap. These components are almost literally lying around on the street. If you want some rig just for vintage gaming, you can't go wrong with this one. On that's it for today. If you've got something to say, leave a comment and see you next time. Oh, and by the way, Merry Christmas.